Welcome to our first episode of Bible Bread, Food for the Soul. This is the first episode in which we will study a small portion of God's Word. Today we're going to begin a study of Psalm 3, the Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son, during the rebellion. Verse 1 of God's Word reads, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, There is no help for him in God, Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I lay me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me. O oh my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone, and thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. There are few crimes more horrifying than when a son attacks and kills his own father. On April 16, 2012, 19-year-old Tucker Cipriano broke into his parents' home in Dearborn, Michigan at 3 a.m. in the morning. Tucker broke in with his friend Mitchell Young looking for drug money. They even planned what they would do. They even practiced what they were going to do when they got there. The plan was to kill Cipriano's family, steal the contents of the family safe, and flee to Mexico. The police found Tucker's the police found Tucker's father, Robert, beaten to death. His mom, Rose, and brother had been savagely attacked, but they, they made it. They survived. Tucker was arrested a short time later. What a horrifying crime. The name for killing one's father is patricide. It's an especially gruesome, wicked sin. The sin of a father, a son who would raise his hand and kill and strike his dad. Instead of this type of horror is the background also of Psalm 3. The superscription of this psalm gives a historical setting. It states that it is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. The Hebrew word translated psalm here means a song that was accompanied by stringed instruments. David's flight from Absalom was a, a very terrifying and frightening moment in the king's life. The insurrection was unexpected by David. The rebellion itself took place at a time when David was strong and well-established as the king of the nation of Israel. The nation was something of a superpower in that region during this time. But this attack did not come from an outside enemy, but from within the family of the king. Unfortunately, it was all too common in the ancient world for a son to murder his father and then to seek to take his throne. Even the mighty Sennacherib, king of Syria, he himself was killed by two of his sons recorded in the book of Second Chronicles chapter 32. The story of Absalom's rebellion is found in the book of uh, Second Samuel's recorded from chapter 15 all the way through 19. Absalom already had blood on his hands. Years earlier, he was guilty of murdering his brother Ammon. Now Absalom began plotting to take the throne from his very own father, David. David was busy, of course, trying to govern the nation. Absalom, in a sneaky way, charmed the people and won their hearts in loyalty. The rebellion began in Hebron, around 25 miles from Jerusalem. And the people of Israel rallied behind Absalom. King David barely escaped with his life out of Jerusalem. He quickly fled from his palace with his men that were still loyal to him. He went up, walking up the Mount of Olives weeping and barefoot with his, his head covered along, along the way. Saul's relative, a wicked man by the name of Shimei, he cursed David. He called down curses upon him. He came out as many enemies of David did. Anyone who had a grudge against David rallied behind his wicked son Absalom. Most of the people were swept by the current and joined the uprising. David and his loyal followers marched all night. By daybreak, they had crossed the Jordan River. This is the background of Psalm 3, David's flight from Absalom. Well, it wasn't a small disappointment. 
but a huge disappointment, a major catastrophe in the life of David. His heart was broken with the greatest of betrayals that had taken place, that of his own son. He must have been thinking, wow, who can I trust now? Where can I go? Who is a spy among my own men? Will one of these men turn me over to my rebellious son Absalom? David loved his son deeply, which added to his complete devastation. David was a king. He was also, though, a father, and he loved his children. The faith that is described in Psalm 3 is forged in the burning hot furnace of affliction and betrayal and great pain. God had literally delivered David from death and betrayal, and David is reflecting on the way that God had rescued him. We see him pour out his heart to God in faith. Martin Luther said, Faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. Every personal trial teaches us as believers to trust in the Lord more fully. Even what others mean for evil, God intends and uses it for our good. This was certainly the experience of, of David in Psalm 3. It is a hymn, an individual lament written to paint a clear picture of what triumphant faith looks like. Especially what faith looks like when it's tested in the fires of adversity and pain. Absalom was the son of David. He had led this revolt against his dad, bringing many of his own countrymen with him in this rebellion. This psalm is written in the midst of one of David's greatest trials that he suffered in his life. He was surrounded by innumerable enemies. It was then in that situation that David called upon the Lord with absolute trust, believing that God himself would rescue him. This psalm clearly communicates that the Lord, he is sovereign over life, even in times of adversity and great danger. He always works for his glory and the good of his people. Thus, Psalm 3 is a psalm both of lament, because he's sorrowful, and of confidence, because he's confident in God. In the midst of trials, like David, we must turn to the Lord with absolute trust, knowing that faith in God leads to triumphant living. David's problems are seen in what, verses 1 and 2. In the midst of the revolt, he calls out, Lord, how have they increased that troubled me? There were many enemies who were loyal to Absalom. It began in secret. It was a concealed rebellion. But now it had grown to a full-blown public revolt against David. David is quoting his oppressors when he laments. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help in God. David's enemies were ridiculing him, implying that God had abandoned David. That's why he was suffering. Their taunting words were also an attack on the honor of God himself. They claimed there was no salvation with God. Secondly, we see David's protection in verses 3 and 4. In this crisis, David made the right choice by turning to God. Many times in the past, David used a shield in battle to turn away deadly arrows and spears and swords. David exclaimed that this shield is what God was to him, an awesome, unassailable protection in the midst of danger. Confidently, he claimed that the Lord would lift him up, lift up his head, and grant him courage and peace. As a man after God's own heart, David affirmed in verse 4, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. The Lord's holy hill refers to the place of the Lord's sanctuary, Mount Zion, there in Jerusalem. It was there that David had brought the ark that represented the presence of God and the power of God. Ultimately, though, this refers to the heavenly throne, the throne room where God sits enthroned as sovereign God. David's troubles... Though they were great, God ruled over them. David knew that God heard him and would answer his plea for help from his throne room in heaven. Thirdly, we see David's peace in verses 5 through 6. Because he had committed his soul and his desperate situation to the Lord, he was at peace. He said, I laid me down and slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me. Because he had committed his soul and the desperate situation he was in to the Lord. David could be at peace. With a deep sense of security, he 
declares, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. David was severely outnumbered. Many people were against him. And he was joined only by a few handful of faithful followers. Nevertheless, David did not fear because he was fortified by the truth that the Lord is all-sufficient, his all-sufficient protector. Fourthly, David's petition in verses 7 through 8. David's heart cry was a cry of a battle cry. Out to God and he gave out to God in confidence, trusting God to defend him and defeat his enemies. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. With the confident trust in the Lord, David confessed, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people. You see, David invoked God's blessing upon all who put their trust in him. This request for deliverance was not only for himself, but for the greater good of the nation of Israel. As Israel's leader, God's rescue of him in this dark hour would result in divine blessing upon all the people of God. So church, remember, in the midst of adversity and danger, in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic, the believer should trust in God. We should do so knowing that deliverance ultimate, ultimately comes from him. This is true both physically and spiritually. <clears throat> Even when we suffer innocently, God ultimately causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him, Romans 8.28. In the hurricane of life storms, God speaks peace to our troubled hearts. He's able to calm the tempest around us. During this time of trial, we should lean on the Lord. We need to know that he is a shield and a strength to his people today. The arm of flesh can never save us from troubles. When the godly entrust themselves to God, however, God will empower us. He will strengthen us. In every trial and difficulty, as believers, we need not fear. Instead, we need to trust in the Lord. Such faith, when tested and toughened in the flames of adversity, will result in victory and deliverance. God's people, I pray that this is a blessing to you, that this will be a help and an encouragement to you, to strengthen you in your faith. Yes, there's a certain amount of faith we have in medical professionals, in our government, and those in authority. But our full faith ought to be in the Lord, who not only defended David physically and spiritually, but defends his people, watches over his people, even on this day. Let's pray. Father, I pray for the people of God that you would strengthen them and encourage them. Help us, Lord, that our faith would be in you as our ultimate deliverer, that our faith and confidence and hope would be in you. Grant peace. Help us to grow in our faith and trust in you. We love you and we thank you. Bless the teaching of your word to our lives, for we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. May God bless you, and let me encourage you to reach out to other church members to be a blessing and a help, and, and pray for one another. May God help us as we seek to love one another in these trying times. God bless you.